name is Steve D'Alessio. I'm the executive director here at the American Precision Museum. These are our main offices up here. Um, what you see in front of you is, and through these cabinets, American Machinist magazine. Uh, we probably have the largest original collection of the magazines. Uh, we go all the way back to the 1800s and all the way through until they went out of business or they've changed hands. So one of the things that we also have available to us are a lot of original drawings. This is from 1909. These are the original drawings of that Brian Grinder that we saw downstairs, the original manufacturing drawings. The American Precision Museum was founded by a gentleman named Ed Battison. And Ed Battison was the curator, or was a curator at the Smithsonian Institute. But he was really not collecting objects as much as he was collecting the history. He wanted to know what machines did, why they did what they did, who built them, uh, what purpose did they serve, and so forth. So he founded this museum when this building was going to be torn down. Uh, he then proceeded in buying the building, putting it on the National Historic Register of Landmarks. Um, so now this building would be preserved in perpetuity. Um, so this original has his original collection of stuff. Uh, then it started to, to grow and change and it became more of a museum. Um, Ed Battison passed away about 18 years or so ago. Um, and from here on it became a museum really focused on telling the story of manufacturing. And you know, lots of important things happened here. You know, it's the, we transitioned from made by hand to made by machine. Uh, adding the word precision to interchangeable parts, uh, becoming, becoming the birthplace of the American system of manufacture. And now today we're really here to inspire and engage the next generation of makers uh, into careers of manufacturing. We just didn't suddenly wake up one morning and there was 3D printers. It kind of evolved. And it really evolved from the concept of making things by machine and then the machines just got better and the technology got better. We started incorporating different things together. Um, and that's how we got to where we are today. But it really started with the idea that we can make things by machine and make them very precise and really have interchangeable parts. It's exciting to see. Twelve years old, I swept floors in a screw shop that was near my house on weekends. Uh, went off to become a tool and die maker. Did my apprenticeship. Realized I wasn't going to be very good at it, uh, so I went off to college to become a manufacturing engineer. Uh, I then spent uh, 25 years in medical device manufacturing, blood chemistry systems, and ultra centrifuges. Uh, I then decided that it was time to chase my entrepreneurial spirit and moved to New Hampshire. Uh, with a family-owned business, which was only one employee at the time. Uh, we moved, came up here to New Hampshire, uh, where we worked together to grow this aerospace and defense business. Um, today, it's 18 or 19 years later, uh, I decided that it was time to leave the day-to-day -day ownership of a business or a partnership, and I took on the role of executive director here in the museum. So I like to say I've started sweeping floors to now I'm preserving history of manufacturing. Uh, one of my first jobs as a manufacturing engineer was to convert a shop from manual machining to CNC. And it wasn't easy. Uh, it took a while to get the old world machinists, very good machinists, to believe that the machine would stop when I told it to stop, or would turn when I said it needed to turn. Uh, lots of times they would hit the e-stop, and it took me a while to convince them, you don't have to hit the e-stop, the program will take care of it. So there is a transition that, that had to take place. But the other thing I saw in going through the industry was that young people would come into the shop and they'd be a real wizard on the machine. But yet they weren't aware of why is the tool glowing red? <laughs> right? When something was going wrong, they didn't understand that. So it took both. It took the experienced manual machinist and the younger, uh, more uh, 
younger machinists that understood the technology, the computer side or the automation side, needed to come together while we brought that next generation of machinists up through the ranks. Magazines like Modern Machine Shop, sites like Practical Machinist, all of those guys were second nature to me. You know, you're never too old to learn and you never, you know, you have to be open-minded to what's going on out there. And uh, sometimes when there's a problem, that's the best solution is some of these knowledge sites, right? Uh, it's the quickest way to get to the end of the tunnel. Well, as I said before, it's really important that we engage the next generation of, of makers. And I do a talk uh, for young people periodically. And one of the things I say at the end, very end of my presentation is we were given 10 fingers. Why do we insist on only using our thumbs? So we're really trying to convince them that, you know, hey, put down all the electronics and let's start thinking about what we can make with our hands. So the museum is focused on that. The museum is really focused on uh, bringing STEM alive uh, through different things. We do STEM camps here where they get to do some coding, they get to do some uh, building, they get to do some design. We did a junk box challenge uh, last summer with the kids, We've given them a bunch of stuff and just try to build something. Uh, we hold educational events like uh, Girls Introduction to Engineering. Uh, where we bring in women from around the area that are professionals uh, to talk about how they got into their careers and what was it like. And they also bring hands-on demonstrations about their career. Vermont Transit uh, brings numbers of, of engineers and they get to build bridges with uh, marshmallows and toothpicks and things like that. So there's lots of engagement going on. Um, we also did a thing called Process Explorer uh, one summer where we started with a uh, 3D design package, let the, them design a square block. Uh, then we, we went and we talked about uh, casting and we had uh, different silicone molds where we casted with quick cure and concrete um, as well as some resins. And then we took those parts and then went to a thermoformer and allow them to benchtop thermoform uh, as well. So they started to see what different manufacturing processes was all about, 3D printing and milling and, and so forth. We also did a talk uh, uh, for adults called Paper to Part, where we started off with a paper drawing, what it was like to draw something by hand uh, on a drafting board. And then I took it to a 3D design software and did the same part in 3D space. And then we went to the bridge port and said, this is what you would have to do to manually machine this. And then we went to our uh, retrofitted bridge port and said, oh, this is how you do it under automation now. So they, they get a feel for the sense that, you know, this is progressive and this is the way it goes. But from the education side and that youth side, we came out with a product. Uh, it's uh, a STEM kit and it's been developed with another company called Spark Shop out in Chicago. And uh, we did one called uh, Energy Transfer. And so what we come out with is a box like this. Everything that the student needs to accomplish the STEM kit is in the box. So they get to open it up. They scan the QR code that takes you to our website. And on the website is all the learning uh, curriculum for activities that are inside this box. So we call it a content sandwich. Uh, the first part of the, the, the curriculum, the first part is a history lesson. That's what we provide. We provide the history. So this one's on the water power, what it was like and how it got to where, where it was powering this factory. Uh, then there's a series of lessons uh, on energy transfer in this box that they can build a dynamometer, they can build a water wheel, they can build all different things, as well as a physical education piece, which is kind of interesting in the sense that there's... Uh, they had a uh, dance choreographer come in and did some dance activity using simple machines as the basis. Uh, so it got a little bit further down the road than just building something. So uh, adds the A, I guess, in STEAM, in STEM. Uh, so we started doing art as well. So everything they need is in the box. If they need a stapler, it's in the box. If they need a pencil, it's in the box. Um, and then the last piece is a video on careers. Uh, so on this one here, the last 
lesson plan is a, a video of somebody talking about what it's like to be a machinist. Um, so we plan on coming out with several more of these over the next uh, year. This was our pilot. Uh, we've placed about 300 or so out there now in different schools. Um, this is being funded through one of our donors. Uh, so right now we can offer them free to the schools uh, as well. Uh, this will be a big part of where we go in the future. Uh, we're talking about uh, well, everything. It's just everything is open here and all kinds of opportunities exist uh, to have a build a robust education program. You know, I think students today with the pandemic and everything else, they're getting, you know, they're getting bored with video. Video is just video to them. Um, so we have to figure out ways to present education to these students in a different way and make manufacturing exciting. Um, and it's not only educating the students, exposing students, but it's also educating the parents uh, that manufacturing offers great careers and great opportunities uh, for young people today.